behalf of the board, Simon and Irma, for what is um, another spectacular this year. Um, in the wake of recent terrorist attacks in London, Manchester, and far and beyond, which we sometimes forget in this country, we're all aware of the urgent need to understand how and why people become radicalised. So I'm delighted that the festival was able to play host for this very, very important discussion. Today's event will be chaired by Claire Chambers, who's from the University of York. We're very friendly in the university sector, so we're delighted that you're here to chair this, Claire. We have Tabish Kahir. Sorry, Tabish Kahir, apologies. Tabish Kahir, Johannes and Jura, and Tarek Nahud. So, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the organisers, Irna Qureshi and Saima Aslam. It's my fourth time at the festival, um, which is only three years old, but there was a taster event in September before it was launched, so I've been here and very much enjoyed myself every single time. Um, I am, as you said, um, I'm a lecturer at the University of York, um, where I work on um, British Muslim and Pakistani writing. Um, and I'm really delighted to welcome three terrific writers um, who are actually very different from each other, but I can see why this theme of writing radicalisation um, has been put together, because each of you have books in this area and also very other, very different writing. Um, so in terms of the format, I'm going to introduce each of the speakers, and then we're just going to um, have a discussion around the theme. Um, no readings today, um, just so we can get more in, um, because it is obviously very topical after the horrible year we've had ever since Joe Cox was murdered um, almost exactly a year ago in Yorkshire, and Brexit, and um, you know the, the attacks that have been happening in the last two months here. Um, so, just taking these writers alphabetically by their surname. Um, born in 1979, Johannes Anuro made his debut in 2003 with the critically acclaimed collection of poems which translates from the Swedish as Only the Gods Are New. His latest novel, A Storm Blew In From Paradise, 2012, was based upon the life of Anuro's father. It received rave reviews rose to the number one spot on the critics' lists, as well as being awarded and nominated for several prestigious awards. Others amongst Johanna's books include Omega, which is poetry from 2005, The Cities Inside Hall, uh, poetry of 2009, If I Were to Die Under Other Skies, fiction 2010, A Civilization Without Ships, which is essay and a poetry from 2011, and I think probably the text we'll most be discussing today, The Rabbit Yard, um, which is, is that out yet, Johannes? It's very imminent. It's out in Swedish. It, it is. came out in Swedish a couple of months ago. Yeah. And there will be a translation into English? I do think so. Yeah. Probably, yeah. Okay, great. And this last novel features discussion of terrorism in Sweden and a case not dissimilar to the Jairans Post and Danish cartoons affair and also the Charlie Hebdo attack, so we can talk more about that. He's been nominated for many awards, such as the August Prize, the Nordic Council's Literary Award, and Swedish Radio's Novel Prize. Born and educated in the small town of Gaia in India, Tabish Kerr is the author of various books, including the poetry collections Where Parallel Lines Meet, from 2000, and Man of Glass, 2010, um, the Academic Studies, Babu Fictions, Alienation in Indian English Novels, 2001, and The Gothic, Postcolonialism and Otherness, 2010, and the novels The Bus Stopped, Filming, and The Thing About Thugs, for which he was nominated for the Man Asian Literary Prize. But Tabish is here in Bradford particularly to speak about two recent novels, How to Fight Islamist Terror from the Missionary Position, and Just Another Jihadi Jane, which came out late last year. And finally, Tarek Mehmood was born in Mirpur in 1956 and came to Britain at the age of nine. There he lived first in Bradford and then in Manchester where he became a respected political activist, filmmaker and writer of literary and children's fiction. He has a PhD in creative writing from Lancaster and now teaches at the American University of Beirut in Lebanon. His novels include Hand on the Sun, 1983, where There Is Light, 2003, You're Not Proper, 2015, and Song of Gul Gulzarina, 2017, which again is the one we're 
particularly interested in today. He was a central defendant in the case known as the Bradford Twelve, which, as probably a lot of you know, was a group of Asian men um, who were defending themselves against racist attacks um, and were, they were, were up um, for trial for using explosives against violent racists in this area and um, were acquitted. And um, Tavish has also um, co-directed the multiple award-winning documentary Injustice. Um, so that's our panel. And so to open up the discussion, I wanted to start by asking all three of you how you negotiated this difficult territory of writing about violence without either aestheticizing it, making it too beautiful, or being gratuitous, being too dark. I mean, it's, it's, it's a tricky subject to, to tackle. So how, why did you choose it and how did you go about um, writing about violence? And I don't mind. Who takes this first? <laughs> Tavish? I mean, there was hardly any way I could avoid writing about it being born in a Muslim family in a small town, having grown up in largely religious various kinds. Uh, so, when the turn came, and this turn came sometime in the 1980s or so, towards a certain version of, uh, of, of Islamic practices, it obviously impacted on my family, and I saw things happening in different ways, some people moving in one direction, some people moving in other directions. Uh, but I, I didn't feel impelled to write about it until, of course, uh, terrorist strikes and uh, the war against terror and all that started taking place. And after that, there was no way. I mean, one had to write about it was my world too, and uh, I had a stake in it. So that, that's the main reason. How one writes about it, of course, it varies. I mean, how to fight Islamist terror from the missionary position was written some years ago, and that was more of a humorous book because I thought people were perhaps taking it far too seriously and that there's a really need to retain our ability to laugh at our own mistakes and other people's mistakes. Then finally I sort of decided to do it. I decided to, to write it. And it the way I tried to do it, the way I tried to sort of navigate the difficulties was to bring in an, an element of uh, magic realism or science fiction, almost. Mm -hmm. Sort of an idea of, uh, there's the suggestion of a uh, time travel, actually, in, in, in the book, Rabbit Yarn, which is the book that talks about this. Johannes, could, um, we're being asked, could you raise your voice a little bit, if that's okay? Because yeah. I think some audience members can hardly sure. do. All right. Um, I think that's very interesting about not wanting to be hijacked by right-wing discourse. Yeah. Um, and I noticed that probably in all three of the novels, um, that you are careful to, as well as you know, condemning the um, extremism, you're also at pains to point out the kind of rise of the right mm -hmm. in the, the rabbit yard. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think the thing that really frightened me with... Uh, with the, growth, with the thing that frightens me with terrorism, beyond the immediate bodily harm that it does to people, is the changes in society that are created by these, these violent acts, these theatrical violent acts. Um, with the idea really, from my perspective, the idea from both the sort of Islamic terrorists, the Daesh, their idea is, in a, in, a, in a perverted way, is very similar to the right-wing idea, mm -hmm. which is to say that, in reality, we're at war already. There's already a war happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and so these acts of war that happen in, in also in peaceful societies are meant to, to, to create a situation where this war will really arise. I mean, this is the, the sort of idea is that it's already a war between, let's say, me and you, because I'm a Muslim and you're not a Muslim. That's the idea of, that Daesh has. And it's also the idea that right-wing people have. This is the idea with the Andish Bering Bravery, mm -hmm. this uh, man that committed a terrorist attack in, in Norway some years ago, killed many, many young social democrat mm -hmm. people. Uh, his idea was also there's a war between if not Muslims, between immigrants and sort of 
non-European people living in Europe, non-European people, and white Europeans. And the idea with this terrorist attack is to, you know, awaken people and to create a situation where this war erupts. And so this idea of, a, of, of having a, a future dystopia also in the book was my way to sort of write about that fear, write about that, that sort of political idea that drives terrorism. Mm -hmm. um, and Tarek, um, what about you? Why did you choose? To, I mean, it's not Song of Gul Gulzavin is about many things, but it does have a terrorist attack actually in Manchester, which makes it very um, obviously topical. Um, so why this topic and how did you go about writing about violence? Well, firstly, thank you very much for sitting and listening to us all. But um, those of you who've had a few birthdays like me will remember, and perhaps you should remember if you don't, that this very city in the 1980s, the British intelligence recruited young Muslim men to go fight in Afghanistan. Why do I know? Not because I read in a book. I met them in the central library just down the road. Some of them went back and I met them there in Pakistan as well. Some died, some came back, some are still alive. And those who came back are round about my age, the father of the guy who then allegedly or actually does the Manchester bombings. But my concern isn't, and I'm very saddened that my novel has become prophetically, tragically prophetic insofar as the events that unfold in Manchester. But the way I come down to the idea of terrorism is not from the view of the terrorist. Because I myself was charged on charges of terrorism in this very city. And had it not been for the supports of people like you, I would have gone down for 44 years. And I wasn't a terrorist. But what I have seen, and as the panel is called radicalization, what I have seen is a highly radicalized terrorist regime right from this country. When Tony Blair and people attacked Iraq on lies, that's a radicalized Britain. We killed a million people. When we destroyed Libya, we didn't keep a count of those people that we killed. We are, I live in Lebanon and I have seen intelligence officers drinking in the bars of Beirut. That's in 2011 and 12, British as well as French. And I saw them also in the 1980s. But actually, because I am a product of British colonialism, I have never known peace, not in the last 200 years. You colonized us. You sold my ancestry. I am Kashmiri for 300,000 pounds or so forth. I then became a refugee. I then became a Pakistani. I then became British. So in a sense, you did that on the backs of terror. And it's still alive today. So I tried to understand what on earth am I doing in this world in which I have never known peace. I have never known a time when British armed forces, correct me, anyone here, are not in action in some part of the world. So part of me is Eastern and part of me is Western. But this part of me is cutting this part. I'm not emotional actually, I've got a little cold. This part of me is cutting this part. Why should this part live in peace and this part die? We live in the same world. So my character, I had a problem. I want to talk about the world in which we live. And fiction sometimes is a world in which we can break away from the chains of that which holds us together, perhaps sometimes in the future, sometimes in the past, wherever we go. But in that, we can, in this fictionalized panorama of ours, we can suspend our disbelief in the worlds that we exist in and begin to try to understand. So I wanted to know what on earth would a man do who has never known peace and has lived in the shadow of a British war. Now my grandparents were in the British army and the area where I come from were all British soldiers in the northern parts of Punjab. So our, my relationship with this society is not born of yesterday. I've taken myself out and gone and live in Beirut, but really, I can never take England out of me. 
Therefore, my character and the characterization of the fictional process is actually not a polemical process. It's a process of trying to understand what are the driving forces for radicalization. Now, the driving force for radicalization is the needs of countries like Britain and America, France and Germany, and all of them, to rip our wealth off. They open the gates of hell in Iraq. Do they expect Mother Teresa's to come out of it? They actually get what they have sown. So in that sense, I had a character. And these are all my own friends. And every event I've described in there, in some way or other, I've lived it or somebody's lived it. And it's brutal. But the novels are not about political events and figures and, and speeches. They're about people's lives. Because that's where we come alive as writers. You know, and if ever you put your pen to, and paper together, yeah. am I talking too much? No, no. I, yeah. Because you're not my shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and in a way, so I, I lighten the tone a little bit. So in a sense, the, when, we, when I try to structure it, I based it on my own life. So what's my journey as a man as well as a writer? Well, I came here in the 60s, and actually I, you know, I, came, I became a packing. I then became a wog, I became a black bastard. Sometimes I was even called a nigger in this very city and later on. But now I've become a Muslim terrorist. And how does that work out in mass popular culture? And I kid you not, this is all true. In 1976, 77, somewhere along the line, somebody came up to me and says, do you speak Paki? I says, oh, yes, Doft. He says, no, no, go and speak some Paki. And I swore at him and told him to piss off. And my son came to see me last year. He goes, Dad, you won't believe this. This man came, white man, came up to me. He says, do you speak Muslim? I says, what did you say? He says, fuck off. And I said, then what happened? He goes, so he said, come on, speak some Muslim. So I said, boom, boom. So my 14-year-old my son had managed to work out how on earth to deal with this bombardment of culture. Now, so therefore, what is that radicalization? It's not. It's somebody else. Actually, it's part of the same scene. So when I watch the films of Mad Max, I don't expect anything else come. They've created outside the shores of Europe and a handful of other countries. It really is Mad Max. They've destroyed country after country and doing it right now. Right this minute, your fighter planes are bombing Syria. Your soldiers are in the southern part on the Jordanian border. They're training people, and these people are not there spreading the Bible. These people are getting training in different parts, and I've seen because I live there. But you don't need to live there, you can check it. So in that sense, my journey to the course of radicalization is the journey of Britain. It's the journey all of you are living. But of course, when writing the novel, it's not all polite. It really is love, loss, and longing, a bit of frustration, and a bit of beer, and a bit of you know, alcoholism and stuff like that. But you mentioned people and um, that being something that a writer uh, um, can do that other, I guess, forms can't do, get inside the head of individuals. And I thought it was interesting that all three of you used the first-person narrative voice. And Tabish, you voiced the inner light of a young girl who joins a Daesh or ISIS um, and goes to these, you know, Syria, which you were just speaking of, Tarek. Um, and you were talking about putting us inside the head of a man who has never known peace. There's also a kind of troubling um, relationship he has with a white woman and domestic violence. And then you, Johannes, um, have a, give us a few narrative perspectives. I haven't read the whole of The Rabbit Yard because it's not yet available in full English translation, but I read the sample and it was really interesting. And you're inside the head of a girl, a bit like Tabish, but you also go inside the head of a writer, yeah. and so I just wanted to ask all three of you about voice, narrative perspective, and characterization in these novels. We follow the sequence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I'll try to keep my answer as short as possible, <laughs> otherwise it will require a very long discourse. Uh, I must say that for me, fiction, for me, creative writing, for me, literature, what it really does, the novel in particular, is enable you to enter another space, both as a reader and as a writer. That's the first thing it does, and, and that's why when as a scholar I'm asked to talk about literature, one of the things I point out, and I mean it seriously, people think I'm kind of 
coming up with an, oh, speak up. Uh, people saying that maybe I'm coming up with an allegorical statement. Uh, people say, what can be done about all this? What can be done about all this hatred and violence and all that? They're not just talking about terrorism. They're talking about all kinds of hatred and violence. And I say, what can be done is to really enable people to read well. For me, the biggest problem is that we can, we do not read well anymore. And digitalization, all that, is actually destroying our ability to read. Uh, because in order to read, you always you enter another space. And you enter a space that is not yours. And as a writer, that is what I want to do. I want my, my readers to be forced to enter other spaces. Uh, I, 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 and in that sense, other words are very important. Uh, Obviously, in order to make your readers enter other spaces, you also need to be able to enter spaces yourself. Um, for me, writing about myself is a rather boring activity. I mean, I've, all of us do one or two novels based on our own experiences, but, but that's it. After that, I don't want to come up and tell you, look, this is what I am. I grew up in a small town in India. I was 25 when I left it. I was 30 when I left India for the first time. No, that I could do in one novel, but that doesn't interest me too much. After that, what interests me is actually listening to other people, their experiences, exploring the way they think, exploring the way they look at what I look at, but look at it differently. So in that sense, voices are extremely important for me. Great. Yeah. Um, the first person narrative came about because I felt that I needed a... I needed a, a, a moral instance in the novel. Originally, I tried to write it as a sort of uh, satire. It had a satirical streak. I wrote it, 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 it in a sense, it's, I, I started writing it after Charlie Hebdo, the attacks mm -hmm. of Charlie Hebdo, which were sort of about satire, in a way, right? Uh, so I thought a novel that sort of responds to this should be and could be satirical. It could have a sort of satirical streak in it. Um, but really what happened was then the terrorist attack against uh, the Bataclan in Paris happened. And I felt that for me, the type of writing that I do and my voice as a writer is can't be satirical. I couldn't find the the literature in satire. I think there are other people that could write those kinds of books, but I, I knew that I couldn't. I knew that for me to write about these things, it needed to have a sense of the sacred. It needed to have a sense of, uh, it needed to be filled with sort of mourning. It needed to be the type of book where some of the beauty comes from not this sort of satirical uh, element of am I being serious? Is this a joke? Is this there's some there's there's some artworks that sort of have that they have a, a moral abyss, and that's the beauty of that artwork. Uh, and then there are other artworks that instead the beauty of the artwork is sort of the ethical dimension, and that's the type of book I wanted to write and to write that book my solution to write that book or to find that book was to sort of step into this landscape myself as a writer. So there's a writer in the book that is very close to myself. Uh, and so, so, so that's how that came about. And uh, the reason that there are these different voices in my book is also to sort of, to have, to be able to have different perspectives to be able to have this perspective that, that you spoke about, the, the, political, uh, the political perspective, let's call it. But I was also interested in uh, a more, let's say, a religious perspective. Or the, I wanted to also ask the question or to think about the question, why do people today, why do Muslims today respond to these conditions, these horrible conditions, in this way, in a way that to me seems 
uh, and to, not only to me, but to the majority of Muslims, seems completely antithetical to our spiritual tradition. How does that happen? Uh, that was also something I wanted to sort of explore. Uh, yeah. I don't think for me the... I think for all of us sitting in this room, you're all amazing if you just think how incredibly sophisticated lives and eventful lives you've led and you're still leading. And each one of us has a story that needs to be told. Each one really, without exception, in this room or anywhere else on the planet, has a desire to tell that story, the ability to tell that story, and that story should be told. So for me, whether which voice or not is really hooked to the story. And it doesn't really matter as we start writing the process. Sometimes I write in the third and switch to the first and then first and switch to the second. Whatever works then. And putting it all together is a much later. I don't know how you guys write, but I mean it takes me bucket loads of tears and years and years to finish this wretched novel of mine. And I thought it would finish me before I could actually <laughs> get to the end of it all. But one of the important things is really, I think it's what's the language in which we write. And I don't mean the sound of the language. I like to write in that which makes me cry, makes me laugh. So if I'm feeling happy, I'm really laughing like a madman. And I'll give you just one example. I wanted to kill a character off in this novel. And my co-writer, editor friend, is called Peter Carlu. He's deaf. I was sitting on a number 50 bus coming into Manchester City Centre. And I phoned him up and I said, Pete, what are you doing? He goes, I'm writing, I'm busy, I'm busy. And because he's deaf, I know he would text me if he was writing. So I knew he was lying. And I could hear the <laughs> kettle clicking in the background. I said, oh yeah. He goes, look, I'm busy, I've got something else. I said, look, I need to kill Yasmin. He goes, throw her in front of the bus. So I said, well, you know, but traffic around here is so slow, Pete. <laughs> she, she'd survive. And then, uh, you know, and then what would I do? I'd be in a mess. He goes, slit her throat. I said, I thought about slitting her throat. But she's got a daughter. I'd have so many loose ends to sort up. And I was going on like that. And uh, he said, uh, something, he said, uh, what's the last word she said? I said, Allah. And he said, Bella? So I said it again. And I got to my bus stop, which is next to a park. And at this park, the driver wouldn't open the door. It was a bit better than you. At least you threw me out of the bus stop. And uh, he wouldn't open the door. And I'm still on the phone. And I, thought, and I looked at the back. The bus had cleared up. <laughs> they all moved to the back. And there was a woman clutching <laughs> her child. And I said to the, dri the guy, you know, the driver, I said, listen, mate, I'm a writer. He's deaf. It's not true. And he locked the, you know the security doors here? He locked them. <laughs> and he leaned on in the back and I got really angry. He said, open that door now. He opened the door and I looked at the bus go past me. And as the bus went past, everyone was looking at me on their mobile phones. So I ran. You know, I thought, I'm going to get arrested. I'm going to have to spend a couple of days in the station. I'm not doing it. And I think that's the worst thing I did because I, you know, and then I went into the park and <laughs> got home. So the question is really, like, our life is full of these things. But where do we capture that bit of reality? How do we mould it into something that becomes fictional? And I did then write the thing as a fictional story and I made Peter look really idiotic in it. And hopefully, I mean, it'll be published soon, so I'm, you know, I got my own back on him because he then told the story to all other people and that really upset me because I hadn't then finished the novel. So in terms of the voice really, in, in that sense, is I find my voice in the concrete situations and the material life of myself, my friends, my fellows, the people where I live, and then I bring that in. So that voice really should speak, and very often writers really make themselves sound super clever. It's, it's nonsense. Without an editor, I would be dead. I'm dyslexic, I can't spell. And yet editors don't get acknowledged. But it's in the polishing and slowly, slowly, you know, you can polish the thing. But really, if you read any of my drafts, they're horrible. You'll throw me out of the room, you know, they're nonsense. Half the time, you know, I get everything wrong. But most importantly, the voice should be here, really. 
It should come from here, whether it's the third, the first, or whatever. Don't try the second, it gets a bit too difficult. But uh, whichever it is, it should come from the heart. But the thinking and editing comes from here eventually. And it's in the revision, and that's where I find that the story comes alive, if it's worthy of being born. Um, I was interested that Johannes and Tabish, you both talk about um, Scandinavia and extremism. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned Anders Bering Breivik earlier, yeah. so um, the, far, the far right in those countries, and also um, you, you mentioned, the, well, the Danish cartoons, mm -hmm. and you're also talking about France and Charlie Hebdo. Um, so what is it, if you portray racism and Islamophobia in Denmark, in Tabish's case, in Sweden, in your case. What is it like for you living there, and what future do you see for Scandinavia? Um, you know, it's multiculturalism um, and refugees living there and things. What is it like, the situation right now? Um, well, I mean, I moved there, you probably grew up. I grew up in Sweden, yeah. we probably have slightly different takes on, 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 on growing up in um, well, I mean, this, this, this is the only novel that I, I've ever written that set in Denmark. And I wrote this after I'd lived there for 14 years or 15 years. <laughs> and finally, I said, okay. And, and I didn't write it because I'd been living there, but because it, there was a story that could only be narrated in that context. When I finished this, my American agent uh, based in New York, uh, he read the manuscript and he called me and he said, Tavish, this is, this is, this is really an interesting novel, it's so funny, and, but can you just consider doing one thing? And he knows that I don't really consider doing things like that, so he was very uncertain. They said, no, don't, 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 don't get upset, but can you just consider doing one thing? I said, what? Can't you move your novel to England? <coughs> and I said, why? But no one in America knows where ours is. But England, they're heard of. And I said, no, but then I would have to move it 50 years back to England because England has changed. And what now is about what England was 40 years back. So that answers some question. <laughs> um, uh, so, so, yeah. Um, and uh, the other thing I would like to add is that when I start writing an, uh, a novel, uh, and I start novels and abandon them after having written 20 pages or 25 pages, but the novel that I complete, by the time I'm working on my 24th or 25th page, I feel that I found the narrative voice. That voice is very important. And, and a point comes where, of course, you tell the voice what to do, but the voice also tells you what to do, okay, in that sense. And, 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 uh, and, and in this novel, for instance, uh, things happen that were based on what I had experienced, but things also happened that I had not experienced. I mean, I haven't experienced any outcry racist uh, attack on me. Okay, uh, but I, when I moved to Denmark, I did all kinds of odd jobs, and one night I was coming back having wash dishes in a five-star hotel midnight, and there was these three, my second year there, like these three very kind of even looking men, in my eyes, uh, blonde, uh, tall, and they stopped me, uh, they run across the road, stop me, and say, hey you, hey you, and I say, oh shit. <laughs> and then they come up to me and say, do you want to become a millionaire in English? And I was so nervous, I didn't realize how, that they were speaking English, and I said, who doesn't? So they take out a sheaf of notes and give it to me. And they said, now you're a millionaire, and go off. So I put it in my pocket, and keep on walking, and get into my flat, and take it out. These were old Yugoslav currency notes. <laughs> so they were probably you, Serbians or, or, or Bosnians <laughs> who, who were just throwing their notes away. So. Uh, there's so many different, really, perspectives to different ways to answer the question. Um, that you post, I think, I think, um, I think there's a dimension of class that always gets lost. At least in Sweden, when you talk about racism in Sweden, people talk about racism in Sweden. It's a dimension of class that makes it so that I don't face racism anymore, mm -hmm. um, because I've made a class journey in a sense. Um, I don't live in a place where people are, where society in general feels like these people should be stopped by the police twice a week, you know. Um, I don't speak in that voice anymore that I used to speak in that, you know, society in general feels that they can 
follow you around to the store. They can sort of do these sort of these stereotypically racist things. Uh, so, me personally, I don't really face a lot of racism anymore in Sweden, partly because of the class and partly because I've grown up quite tall. People don't really. I think there's definitely an element of sort of trying to impose the threat of physical violence uh, with racist slurs. Uh, so I don't face, face, I don't face a lot of racism anymore. What I do face, what we do face is this, the thing that, that this story about the bus uh, really sort of expresses, and that is that as a Muslim, part of your culture, part of, parts of your culture, parts of your language becomes super politicized. Uh, <coughs> I go to Friday prayer and put on a, a kufi, much less, you know, a more traditional uh, Muslim clothes, and then I face not racist slurs still. I don't, I don't, I don't get that so much, but you can, there's definitely a change in in the way people treat you, in the looks you get, and so on. Um, whether or not to call that racism is sort of up for grabs. I'm, I'm one of the people that feel like maybe, maybe we shouldn't call that racism. That's something else also. That is the sort of tension that exists in multicultural societies that we have to deal with somehow. Um, and this dimension of class and that, this dimension of who has power in society and so on, that makes it feel like racism. It feels like racism because even though it is a religion, once you, when you're inside the religion, so to speak, it feels like it's, it, it's as real as my skin color. But I, I'm being a convert, maybe. I'm also aware that it isn't. That it is that people that look from the outside, they think, well, you can just stop being a Muslim if you don't want to have these problems. And that's sort of the tension that exists in, in Sweden and in sort of Scandinavia and maybe in all of Europe today is, is that thing where your cultural expressions, your religious expressions become very, very politicized. And uh, there's a lot of attacks on women that wear hijab, for example. Uh, but they are no, no longer are there. There's, when I was young, you had, we had skinhead Nazis that attacked people. We don't really, we have, th that exists because they blow up things and so on, but it's not, it's not as present. It's not as sort of normalized. That thing is not normalized anymore. Um, that's one way to sort of answer the question, I guess. Well, I'm not sure about all that because the, what I know about Sweden is that the trains run on time, they drink a lot of very nice beer, and, uh, however, the question of racism is not about me and not about you and not about you. This is an historically evolved ideology. It's to do with whiteness and not white people. It's a process. So in that sense, I don't think it's separatable from any of the European countries. And what we see, actually, across... Hopefully we can have the audience ask questions. Yeah, in a minute, yeah. You know, that what we do see is a massive rightward swing. The racism of today is dominated by Islamophobia and its different facets and permutation. But the one, as I was trying to explain earlier on in my first anecdote, has not gone away. It's just added on another layer to the present. So in a sense, you know, the job of writers and all of us, in a sense, is also to bring that process in. And I think that's what certainly I've tried to do and we've all tried to do in different ways. So in that sense, really, I, I think that the reason we're seeing a right-wing swing, and these groups are now becoming more and more united. A lot of my novel is set in Bradford. There was a time only two or three fascists, or 12 from the National Front, would dare come down to Manningham. And seven, eight, nine thousand of us would stop them. Same in Manchester, same in London, same in Southall. That's no longer the question. 12,000 football supporters on the 24th of June, marched through London. It can be argued they may not all be racist. It's probably true. However, they were swimming on a tidal wave of Islamophobia, hence they marched. And the deaths in Norway, the 77 people are killed. 
they're killed for an ideological reason, and that is to fight against what's conceived as some sort of a multicultural process of development within the liberalization of Western Europe. So the racist wave of today is intricately linked. We will see the growth of Padiga-type parties in this very country. EDL is absolutely huge. If you just read the right-wing Facebooks or their different social media things, you will see that our side is actually eclipsed by the development of this movement. And this is a European-wide phenomenon, and I will end on saying this, that this is not an accident of history, but a deliberate product of an historical process. The last time we saw it was in the 30s, and actually the right-wing forces are far, far, far bigger today around Britain, around France, around Austria, including Sweden. Ships of refugees being attacked by gangsters, by gangs going around on the street. Not much different to here. Whether I experience it or not is not really that relevant. So the question comes is, how do we bring all those in? For God's sake, you never want to read a book in, in which, well, I've just said, you, you know, that's all you end up reading, you know, unless you have the other anecdotes. So we bring in a few other things, but I think I'll stop now. Yeah, did you want to come in? I just wanted to say, I mean, my, I think my point is... Um, I think the thing that's different is, at least in Sweden, I don't really don't know what it's like in Britain. In Sweden, the the racism is is no longer articulated. The people that articulate racism as I'm white, therefore I'm better, and you're black, therefore I'm better. Those people are now a fringe group. Uh, I think, and I think the reason that these right wing groups have become so huge. Part of that is that they've left that, maybe not ideology, but that way of arguing things. And instead they argue, I'm Western, therefore I'm better. Or the Swedish society and Swedish culture can't handle these Muslims because they're Muslims, not because they have black hair. Because you have, in Sweden at least, you have people that, that are black that are part of this right wing movement. Now. You have people that are you know, have black hair that come from uh, Kurdistan that might have be Islamophobic or have something against Islam that join these groups. Um, and that's sort of what I mean is that as long as I don't, ex when I don't express that I'm Muslim and when I express that I'm Muslim, it's a world of difference how I'm treated. Uh, when, I belong, when I very clearly belonged to the working class, when I was young, it's a world of difference how I was treated. Today when I belong to the, to, to, of the middle class, and I don't really mean to say, I, 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 I'm not saying that racism has disappeared from, from Swedish society. Uh, not at all, not by any means. I just, th but my point, my personal perspective is I don't face it as much. Young people that I work with and give creative, creative uh, writing classes to testify to, to these things that I mentioned, they, they're stopped by police uh, twice a week, three times a week. Um, they can't get jobs. They, uh, they go to very poor schools, but that's because of class. That's also because of class, the way class intersects with ethnicity. It's not just because they're brown. That's not all it is. There's also the, the, the question of class and the way that racism today articulates itself as Islamophobia, I think. I'll let Tabish have the last word on I would just like to say that that's my impression of Denmark too. It's not, of course, there are all kinds of races are still there, mm -hmm. and there is a small number. A lot of people who are supposed to, who even kind of combine with these old kinds of races, are not races in the old sense of thinking of different races and so on and so forth, and skin color and so on and so forth. Uh, the kind of, uh, kind of categories they use are more economic and cultural. Uh, and in that sense, I think one has to be careful, at least uh, from my experience of Denmark, of using old terms to address these new developments because they do not really cover everything that's happening there and they drive some people into those groups rather than actually prevent other people from entering it. Uh, so at the moment I think, and I'm talking as someone who has always considered himself as belonging to the left, though I don't necessarily get along with people on the left every time. <laughs> but uh, but I, I, I do feel that we, we are making the biggest mistake
at stake on the left has been its, its inability to come up with categories that take into account these different kinds of reactions, which are not exactly the same as old forms like racism and so on and so forth, as we have understood them. Not that they have disappeared, but something else has come to <coughs> that's, that's my feeling. Well, I think we will open this up to questions from the floor. I do want to say that um, there will be copies of Tarek's book being sold by Waterstones afterwards, and I believe um, Johannes's and Tabashi should be available in the uh, in the festival bookshop. Otherwise, um, Amazon. Otherwise, Amazon. Uh, so I'm sure you've got lots of questions for the authors. Yes. slightly different way, I would say it's a failure of reading. Because what they do is they look at anything, it could be a text, it could be a cultural identity, and they come up with a pure reading of it, which means one particular reading of it. And that's the only reading you're allowed to make. So this is what Danishness is. And, and, and of course, Danes, you know, real Danes, are just as hybrid as me, as you. The English are a hybrid people. English is a hybrid language. <laughs> okay? So, so it's, it's a failure of reading. So I, I agree with you, but I say that's why I, 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 I started off by saying that what we need to do is enable people to read well, which is, that, which is what all fundamentals do. They come up with one reading and they hold it, which is, of course, the reading of purity. But, uh, I, I'm not sure I agree with you in all the things. I don't think all fundamentalisms are equal. They're certainly not, certainly not equal all the time. The Hindutva movement of India has been linked to far-right organizations across the world, not now, but for a very long time. This is not a new phenomenon. The only new phenomenon is the new waves of violence that they've unleashed in, in, in India, particularly against the minorities and the scale of those. But the same position, if you look in Pakistan, it's the Muslims that are in the majority. And then the position of Hindus and Christians and Sikhs, whatever few numbers there are, and political. One of my friends said it is better to be a dog in Pakistan than a Hindu because at least I might be able to go. These are his words, you know, I know him well, that it, it would be uh, better because I can't go somewhere. So in that sense, they're not equal, but there is another fundamentalism, and that is of imperialism. Remember that when they went to war and opened the gates of hell, George Bush was it? Bush Senior was it the first time around? I can't remember now, there's been so many wars. God spoke to him. That's fundamentalism. Tony Blair had a Bible next to him. They sent their priests to Afghanistan. They sent their chaplains to Afghanistan, for God's sake. That's the fundamentalism that needs defeated. It's nobody else who has nuclear bombs. The people from Syria, Afghanistan, Libya haven't occupied Wales. It's we who've done the occupation, time and again for the last few hundred years. So. In, in this context, and I think you're right on class, but class not, has also an international aspect to it in relationship of country to country, people to people, and its gradations go down. So in my opinion, I, don't, I think that there is a natural alliance between the extreme right, and Muslim forces are no different. I don't see many ISIS statements condemning Israel. I mean, I don't think I've seen any. In fact, they are treating Nusra Front fighters on a daily basis, and backing the, the so-called the, the, the jihadists, and attacking the Syrian army, 
three, four times this week the Israelis have attacked them. Because where a few bullets have landed in occupied Syria in the Golan Heights. So the absurdity, that's fundamentalism. It's the Hindu fundamentalists, it's the Christians, it's the who has these major nuclear weapons. And actually in Pakistan, never have the right Islamic, Islamic organizations won much seats. They dominate in the cultural process, but they're not dominating in the political and economic setup. So I'll stop on that one, really. I, I don't think that these issues are an equal conflict, but an unequal process, and they can't be understood by equating them in any way. It's a dynamic level of understanding. Um, we take, uh, I saw a question here. And That's a very good question, and let me introduce you to the speaker as well. He's the president of the British Trade Union Congress, and I was in Sweden, courtesy of a friend here, and I asked him a question. And he pointed at me there, and he said, that man, when he came out of jail, I used to be a bus driver, and he wouldn't pay his bus fare in breath. No, I haven't got an equivalent answer for you. <laughs> I really searched my mind as you were talking, other than the fact that I did pay my bus fare. In, this was in 1982. Now, firstly, I think if we look at the current situation, there really is a phenomenal wave of violence. And I don't think we've seen anything like it before. And a lot of the violence is being directed at women as well. In the 70s and 80s, they had the Paki bashing gangs in Manningham, in Dublin, here in Manchester, Birmingham. It was a big phenomenon when white youths used to come out late after the pubs closed at 10.30 and go on Paki bashing. We were able to organize self-defense, and we did as well. And by we, actually, it was never only black people. And that's another division that takes place. We had a black unity at one time. So I'm black, and Arabs were black, and Africans were black, and Indians were black, because we saw black as a political color, and white as a political color. None of you are white. There is no white. These are political colors in that sense. Its destruction and its, its devaluation, I think, has been a loss within the movement. But it's not the Muslim community, because I don't believe it exists. I don't believe a Christian community exists, or a Jewish one, or a Sikh one. I think Christians, <coughs> Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Sikhs, lots and lots of communities exist that get formed and reformed, changed and rechanged. But it's the progressive movement that has been atomized and destroyed right across the world. There was a time when we grew up, if somebody died on your street, the street would come and clean your house irrespective of who died in Bradford. I think those who've got a few zeros after their birth, like me, will remember those days. Now if somebody dies, they shut the door on you at times. They'll cross the door as if there's something right. And you can trace the antecedents to that 
of Thatcher coming to power, of atomizing the trade unions, atomizing and breaking the community organization. So where do we go? In, my, in, my, in a way, I'm speaking in London at the Marxism conference next Saturday on the very subject of self-defense. I don't think there's any choice left. Sooner or later, we have to have a position that those who are under attack for whatever reason, from whatever sources, have to defend themselves by whatever means are necessary to defend themselves. We made bombs because we believed we had to organize and defend ourselves against forces that were organized and coming to attack us. So the situation now is dire. But actually, the, in, the duty is not upon us. If white people wish to hold a society in which they can walk out, you've got to organize. And you've got to organize in white communities where the racists are coming from. You don't do that. You haven't got a society left. So it's not racism that will tear it apart. Racism is welded it together. That's the history of this country. So in that sense, I think that we are entering a moment we have no choice. And we cannot live in a world, I can't allow my children to open the door without having a look who's outside the door anymore. When my son comes in, he said, I've just, my friend got punched down the road. I'll give you another little story of the scale of it. My son was on a bus. And this is how ridiculous the situation has gone. How we organize, I don't know. My son was on a bus with another 15-year-old. The 15-year-old was wearing the Pakistani clothes. And there were loads of younger kids, you know, saying, come on, you Pakis, get off, give us our country back, this, that, you know, really abusing them. But the white kids were small. My son's quite big, and both my son and his friend are kung fu trained, though he's got a finger. He managed to put, get them stuck in the lawnmower recently, so he, he's not doing very well on that. So anyway, as they were getting on the bus, they kept telling them to shut up and go away, so these white kids formed their friends. By the time they got into the city centre, there were loads of white kids, and they surrounded my son and his uh, friend. So my son's friend is quite big, so he started rolling his sleeves up. He said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Got ready to fight, nothing much, you know, I don't mean anything. Because he said something in Arabic, all the white kids ran away. I mean, it's got to a position that we are looking at a language becomes a, an idea which is so violent, either you're scared of it, or you're going to be attacked for it. So in that sense, the only way of social organization, it has to be mass. I think, and there is no choice. There will be a time we have to patrol now the police. In our case, at times, I'll finish after this, the police in our case either were unwilling to defend us, sometimes were actually actively act, uh, supporting attacks upon us. Not every single one, but we had punch-ups with them when they too were drunk as well. But now the situation is I don't think they even have the resources if they want to um, do the thing. The scale is so enormous because we are pre-pogrom stages, if we like. The scale has reached in such levels. And let's not judge by those who simply swear at us. The racism isn't simply at the street. It's right in the echelons of power and all the way down. This racism wasn't born down here and went up there. It wasn't white people in Britain saying, let's go colonize Africans and let's go colonize India. It was the other way around. It was people at the top who sent them down and then created all the ideologies necessary to hold us down. So my answer to yours is I think we have to reorganize. I think we have to organize because this country is worth fighting for and it's ours and it's not theirs. And if we don't fight for it, we won't have it. So I know there's lots of questions. Tabish wants to come in. I don't know if there's going to be any time. Because how, have we got time for one more? Or? No. <laughs> so you, you'll have to catch these writers and ask them individually. I'll let Tabish. I'll try to keep it very short, and it might be controversial. Because at the other side of what I have been trying to say lately, uh, see, the failure has been mutual. Uh, the West has not faced up to the consequences of its own prejudices. Uh, and very often people like me have come up with very relevant critiques of that. That critique had then been taken and read in other circles in ways that justify those prejudices in the attack. Uh, my good friend Shashi Saru wrote a brilliant book about how empire did not do anything for India, how it looted India. I agree with all of it. And I spoke to him and I, I said, what happens when your arguments are taken up by Hindu Swati or Islamic reactionaries? 
to justify their own. It does two things. First of all, it justifies local hegemonies, things which are already there. And, and secondly, it also justifies uh, this feeling that, well, we cannot really do anything. Things have to be done. It's all out of control. Uh, 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 Richard, why every time uh, you, you come across these uh, politicians from places like Syria and, and other places, rightly sometimes condemning America for what it is doing, but at the same time also saying, oh, America is not doing enough to help us. That kind of mentality is part of this circle. And we, I think, as left leaning post colonial subjects, have failed to realize that our legitimate critique can be taken and used in another space for another set of reasons altogether. Which doesn't mean that we should stop coming up with critiques, but we should also be very aware of how it's going to be used there and come up with a prior critique or an extra critique of its misuse in those spaces. That I think I need to say because I do feel that that has been a failure of people like me. Great, so we never stop critiquing. I think we should end it there, and um, I want to remind you of the books you need to go out and buy, which is How to Fight Islamist Terror from the Missionary Position, and Just Another Jihadi Jane, which is The Rabbit Yard and Johannes Amuro's other books, the ones that are available in translation, and especially um, Songs of Gulzarina by Tariq Mahmood. Um, and we want to thank all these writers, and thank you. <laughs>